Um, so, so family, actually, I wasn't going to be preaching today. So on the schedule for today is Pastor Dan, who unfortunately is not well. It's non-COVID related, thankfully, but he is at home recuperating. So last night I was faced with this question. I could either stay up all night and write a sermon to keep us within our cruciform series, or I could do something else and we could lean into one of our values at Wellspring, which is of being vulnerable and real with each other and like real human beings. And real human beings get tired and sick and need to take a break. And real human beings need sleep. So I figured, okay, Pastor Dan, he can't push through it. He's going to stay home. And instead of me staying up all night, I actually have in my home, staying with me for two weeks, two pastors, my mom and my dad, who are visiting from the Philippines, and either of them could give a wonderful message. So my dad happened to have one ready. So today, you're going to hear not from me. Uh, who had a good six and a half, seven hours of sleep last night. Thank you, (laughs) Dad. Um, You're not going to hear from Pastor Dan. You're actually going to hear from my dad. Um, And I could tell you, I could tell you about, you know, all the Bible schools that they have in the Philippines and throughout Southeast Asia. I could tell you about the books he's written. But I'll just tell you that he's a lovely dad and that I'm thankful for him. And I'm really glad he's here today. I love you, Dad. So if you can welcome my dad, Reverend Norman. He's going to share with us an encouraging word today. Oh, wait, I have a lay for you. Okay, and your clock. Okay. I get to kiss the pastor, wow. (laughs) Well, it is a special joy, a very special joy to be with you all. And thank you for those of you who knew that we were locked down in the Philippines for over 14 months, unable to leave our premises, our Bible school. Uh, But the word of God is not bound. We still had uh, Bible schools operating throughout Asia by Zoom. And yet we were trying to come here to see our families, our younger daughter's family in Florida and Pastor Rebecca's family here in Hawaii. And Uh, Thank you for those of you who prayed because they switched the laws and allowed us to come. And three days later, we were on the plane, headed out. We had to jump through a lot of hoops, and we'll have to jump through a lot of hoops to get back. So if you want to keep praying, we're not back yet at our Bible school, which will start next month. But uh, we're so glad to be here with you now. And I'm so glad to be able to substitute for Pastor Dan this morning. We love and highly appreciate him. He's a great speaker, just like Pastor Rebecca and just like her mom. Uh, Her mom says that Pastor Rebecca is the best preacher in the family. So uh, I'm going to try to uphold the family tradition this morning, okay? And you can be the judge however you want, okay? But we want to look this morning at a topic that's throughout the scriptures, and we can entitle it, The God of the Valleys, from a story in 2 Kings chapter 20. And if you want, sometime later, read this whole chapter and the whole story. But what it's about is that in this story, Israel was attacked by the Syrians. Hello, hello. Let's see. Okay. Israel was attacked by the Syrians, who had a much larger army. But God miraculously helped Israel to defeat them in a battle up in the mountains. But the story goes on to say that after they were defeated, the Syrian generals had a gathering to figure out why they were so defeated when their army was so much bigger. And they decided that it was because the God of Israel, they thought, was a God up in the mountains of Israel. And when they fought Israel up in, you know, home court advantage for basketballers, uh, up where their God was strong, then they were defeated by Israel. But they decided that they would send another army out to fight Israel in the valleys. And so they thought that they would win there. But just before that second battle, the Lord sent a prophet to Israel to encourage them. And the prophet declared, thus says the Lord, because the Syrians have said, the Lord is the God of the hills, but he is not a God of the valleys. 
Therefore, I will deliver all this great multitude into your hand, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So to show everyone that he was not only the God of the mountains, our God also through this victory over much superior forces, this victory in the valley, he showed he's also the God of the valleys. Now, most of us know that mountains uh, repeatedly speak in the Bible of blessing, glory, of many wonderful things. We have Elijah who on Mount Carmel brought revival to the Israelites. We know Jesus on the mountain of transfiguration was revealed, his face shining like the sun, and the glory of God was revealed in the face of Jesus Christ up on that wonderful mountaintop experience. Moses, near the end of his life, was instructed by God to go up to the top of Mount Nebo. And there, the Bible says, God showed him all the promised land from the northernmost uh, portion up from Dan down to the far southern desert. And we all know that on mountaintops, that's where our vision is the greatest, in the natural, but in the spiritual, in mountaintop experiences. God can show us his future plans. God can show us his calling and purposes for our lives if we are on a mountaintop experience like Mount Nebo. And then there was also David on Mount Zion. And we can read in the Old Testament how David established his throne on Mount Zion and built a tabernacle for the worship of God. And so Mount Zion in the Old Testament was synonymous with the authority of the king and the worship of God which translates in the New Testament for us as New Testament believers. In Revelation chapter 14, we read, Jesus in heaven was standing on Mount Zion in the midst of the worship of his saints. So the earthly Mount Zion is just a a, a shadow of the heavenly worship of Jesus on the heavenly Mount Zion. And so through all of these different types of mountains. We love if we can ever experience a mountaintop experience. But what happens when we find ourselves in the valleys? The Bible talks about the Valley of Achor, which translates for us as the Valley of Trouble. Anybody like going to the Valley of Trouble? Doesn't sound too encouraging. What's even worse, we all know the Valley of the Shadow of Death. And there's the Valley of Dry Bones, a cemetery in Ezekiel 37. There's the Valley of Baca, translates the Valley of Weeping in Psalm 84. And there's the Valley of Rephaim, which translated into English is the Valley of Giants, gigantic opposition to the people of God. Now, these valleys are never, we never write them on our bucket list of places we want to visit in our lifetime, right? We might check off all the the mountains we'd like to visit, but not these spiritual valleys. However, the traveler through life will spend more time traveling through the valleys than on the mountaintops. If you've ever taken long hikes or taken very long road trips, you'll know you're in the valleys much more of the time than on the mountaintops. And in the same way in the spirit, if we are going to be pilgrims traveling along on the highway of God, pressing on for the mark of the high call of God in Christ Jesus, if we want to fulfill our purposes in life, then we are going to be traveling through a lot of valleys. And that's why we want to know the God who not only can give us victory on the mountaintops, but that we serve the God of the valleys. Amen? So we don't have time to look at all of the valleys in the Bible. We'd be here till the cows come home, and I don't even know if you have any cows in Hawaii, so that would be an awful long time, okay, if you've ever heard that from the mainland, till the cows come home. But uh, we just want to look very briefly at a couple and then give you some more suggestions that you could use sometime in the future to study this out. Uh, And study the mountains, too, to understand more of our pilgrim roads. 
that we will travel through this life as we are headed towards the eventual Mount Zion of heaven. So one that we want to look at this morning is the Valley of Dry Bones. Oh, that's not a very friendly place, okay? But in the Valley of Dry Bones, there was an important work of God that happened for God's people. They reconnected, each dry bone coming together, and then they gained new life, new power, so that they rose as a mighty army by the end of this experience Ezekiel had in Ezekiel 37, in this valley of dry bones. Now, this starts out talking about how then, well, let's read it. Ezekiel 37, verse 1. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me around them. There were very many in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, mortal, can these bones live? I answered, oh, Lord God, you know. And what did these bones represent? God gives us the answer down in verse 11. He said to me, mortal, these bones are the people of God. They say, our bones are dried up. Our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. That's a description of being in the valley of dry bones. We feel cut off. We feel defeated. No hope. Have you ever felt like God is far away? Maybe you've even felt terrifying times when you feel that you've been cut off from God, that God has rejected you. Maybe you feel that the hopes you've had in life have just faded and, and, and they're gone and, and, and you're spiritually dry, maybe even feel dead. Well, welcome to the valley of dry bones. And God allows his people at times to go into this valley to do a work within our lives and our hearts. And so... Why do people become disconnected, dry bones? Well, many reasons. We have just a few tossed out here. There can be unforgiveness. Lots of times people separate themselves because they won't forgive the faults of others that have hurt them. Sometimes it's fear. We can be afraid of failure or afraid of rejection. And rather than try to face problems, we retreat back into our smaller and smaller world to where we become disconnected to God and disconnected to each other. Jealousy can separate friends. Pride, where people feel that, that they're better than someone else and, 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 and won't connect. There can be apathy, where we're just a little too lazy and we just don't make the effort. There's a multitude of things that can keep us from being properly connected, not to another dry bone, but to become connected as the body of Christ, as the Apostle Paul taught in Ephesians 4.16, that we are each to be uh, knit together, joined together according to the will of God, that Christians are to be connected with each other to nourish and strengthen each other. And so we need our brothers and sisters. We need to be properly connected in the body of Christ. Or if we're all alone, we can get dislocated, we can get dry, we can feel spiritually dead and even cut off from God. But the first step to renewal that God showed to Ezekiel was that he was to prophesy that the bones were to come together that there was to be a, a, a new commitment uh, of, of just c connectivity there, uh, speaking for us, that we are to get reconnected to the body of Christ. We're to find out where have we separated ourselves and lost the flow of life and encouragement that God wants to bring us from other brothers and sisters. I heard of a, of a, a man of God once that uh, went to a church and uh, 
in the spirit, he just discerned that the anointing of healing was upon uh, an elderly lady in the church, an anointing of healing for the pastor who had been sick for many months. And the woman came up to the pastor and said, Pastor, can I lay hands on you and pray for you? I, I just feel that God has anointed me to, to, to bring healing. And the pastor said, no, no, I, I don't do that for the church members. And he was not properly connected. He did not receive his healing. Well, there are so many ways that we need each other. And so the first step to renewal is that we have a fresh commitment, a new unity, first in our own heart. Psalm 86 verse 11 says the prayer, unite my heart, Lord. If we are divided, if we go through our own struggles, it's hard to be properly connected to others. So we need to have God unite our own heart so we can gain united families, we can gain united church, and your church can be plugged in with the body of Christ, like through compassion and through other avenues through which you can be channels of the love and life of God to a needy people of God. Now, after the bones came together, the Bible says that they were not yet alive. So the Lord told Ezekiel in in Ezekiel 37, verse 9, to prophesy to the wind, prophesy to the breath, and prophesy that the, the breath would come in to those dry skeletons that needed life. And that word in the Hebrew for wind or breath, uh, ruach, is the same word for spirit. And so we need to have the spirit of God come within us as we are freshly united, it can prepare the way for a new move of the Holy Spirit among us. In Acts chapter 2, it says they were in one accord and suddenly, like a mighty wind from heaven, the Holy Spirit came down and the church was birthed in power to begin their mission. There was a time over three centuries ago that there was a, a count, a German nobleman in Germany named Count Zinzendorf. And he invited a bunch of ragtag uh, uh, pilgrims, uh, actually refugees from war and persecution. He invited them to come live on his large estate. And these hundreds of uh, Protestant believers that for centuries had been persecuted across Europe, they found a resting place in his uh, estate, but rather than be fully thankful and uniting in this new peace and prosperity, they started arguing with each other. They started uh, kicking against the, 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 the things that the count, the owner of the land, requested of them. And a number of them even labeled Count Zinzendorf their benefactor. They labeled him the Antichrist. That's not exactly, you know, the unity of the brethren. And so Count Zinzendorf really had to seek God and pleaded with the brethren for unity. They came to a new commitment to each other. And when they had that commitment in place and began to pray, the Spirit of God fell upon them. And that prayer meeting they started lasted 24-7 for over 100 years as they sent out missionary after missionary and helped spark the Protestant world missionary movement of modern centuries. It started with a new unity, commitment to each other, and it ended up touching the world. Back in the Philippines, shortly after we started our Bible school, we found one of my co-workers was not content with situations and he was uh, causing some trouble and it was just not working out and he uh, felt led to leave which uh, was was the Lord uh, either change or leave but right after he left we were in the Bible school one night on Tuesday nights we have what we call family night we play games maybe we watch a nice Christian movie and we were uh, sitting around and I thought, oh, uh, I just saw a new video sermon that uh, was really nice. Why don't we play that? And everybody's sitting there eating popcorn. No prayer, no worship. We just played games, you know, gone crazy with, with you know, running around in chairs and everything. We're sitting there eating popcorn, watching this message entitled The Coming Revival. When all of a sudden I saw from the 
right side, a, a corner of the classroom. I saw and heard a wind come in, and there were no windows there. It was solid cement on both sides. And the wind came in and started to hit the students. And when it hit the students, they fell off their chairs, and it bloom, bloom, bloom. And there was one young teenage sister over on the side, and she saw everybody falling down. She grabbed her chair, and when the wind hit her, poof, she knocked over her chair with her and fell on the ground. And through that unusual manifestation of the wind of God, God began to move in a wonderful way at our Bible school. And our Bible school has multiplied to become dozens of Bible schools in many nations of Asia. God has blessed because where there is the unity of the brethren, there God commands the blessing. Psalm 133. So we want, by God's grace, to uh, have these steps towards, if we're in the dry, valley of dry bones, towards leaving the valley of dry bones. You see, there are times we need to go into these experiences if we need uh, a fresh commitment to our family or to the church or uh, a fresh commitment to God, then there are times that God will allow us to come into this difficult valley. But we're not to stay there. Psalm 23, verse 4, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Psalm 84, passing through the valley of weeping. Our final destination is called a mountain in Hebrews 12, but you have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem. Our final destination is the mountaintops of mountaintops, heaven itself. But in the meantime, much of our pilgrim road here on earth will lead us through valleys. So we want to learn our lessons so we can move on in God and not stay any longer than needed in these difficult valleys. So after Ezekiel had prophesied the breath, he prayed and the and the Spirit of God began to move. Then it says, breath came into them, and they lived and stood up an exceeding great army. In this valley, they started out a cemetery of bones, and they ended up united and strong as a mighty people of God. And God can take your hopelessness, your dryness, you're feeling uh, far from God. He can turn it around when we make those new commitments. Maybe a new commitment to church attendance or to serving in the church or to uh, praying for your brother or your sister or, or, or giving to compassion. Whatever God has for you, it's that we learn to build together and we will strengthen ourselves to come to greater maturity in God. Now, we want to look shortly at one other valley this morning. That's the valley of Baca from the Hebrew, but we translate it in English as the valley of weeping. And God will often lead us or allow us to go into valleys of sorrow, discouragement, depression, but the purpose is to motivate us to move on in God so that we will move up to the mountaintops of great joy. And we can read this story of this spiritual journey in Psalm 84, verse 5, 6, and 7. So let's start in verse 5 where it says, Blessed is the one whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. Now we've mentioned Zion spiritually speaks of heaven itself, the place not of David's throne on earthly Zion, but of the son of David's throne in heaven. Not the worship of David in his tabernacle on the earthly Mount Zion, but the worship of the Lamb of God on the spiritual Mount Zion in Revelation 14. And as we have in our heart, the highways to Zion, the purpose and goal of our life is we are only passing through 
the situations of this present life. We're only here for maybe 50 years, maybe 90 years, but we are preparing ourselves for millions of years without end. And so we need to see the value of our pilgrimage here on earth because it is preparing us for our placement, for, our, for what we will receive and be ready for in heaven. Jesus said in Matthew 25 of his faithful servants, you were uh, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful with much in your earthly life. Now I will make you ruler over much. We will be promoted. We will have places forever in God's eternal kingdom dependent upon how we journey through this life, how we become fruitful serving the Lord, how we build up the body of Christ and proclaim him to a lost and dying world. So we want the highways to heaven in our heart, but where does this highway go through? In the next verse, Psalm 84, verse 6, it says, As they pass through the valley of Baca, or the valley of weeping, they make it a spring. The rain also covers it with pools. And so, if we're going on with God, we're going to have seasons of weeping, of discouragement, things that really seem to be pulling us down. I remember when... Uh, our eldest daughter, now you're Rebecca, your pastor Rebecca, when she first left home after high school to come to college, my wife wept for many months. Our precious daughter had left home. We didn't have Skype and Messenger and Facebook and Marco Polo back then. No, it, she was going to the other side of the world. And it was a very difficult valley of weeping. But the Bible says, weeping may endure for a night, but joy will come in the morning. Blessed are you who, sor who mourn now, you will be comforted. And right now, my wife is not sorry for having sent our daughter on into the purposes of God. Right now, she's there hugging Pastor Rebecca, and she's hugging back. And we see the purposes of God are good. Yes, we pass through separations. We pass through difficulties. We pass through the valley of weeping. But the key is we don't live there. We pass through it. We are headed for something higher. We see that these are experiences that maybe we will need, but let's embrace what God wants to do in these valleys and let's go on upward to the high call of God in Christ. And so, excuse me, we read that in the valley of Baca, verse 6, they make it a spring. The rain covers it with pools. So in the valley of weeping, we'll find springs and pools of refreshing. And that's normal with, you know, geography around us. If you want to go, if you're a weary pilgrim that needs water, don't go to the mountaintop to find water. Go to the valleys. That's where you'll find the streams, the rivers, the pools, the wells. And so we need sometimes to go through the valley of weeping so that the wells will be opened in our heart. The springs of living water will be opened in our heart. And not just in our hearts, but in our community. And so you, church, you are a wellspring for yourselves, for the community. So that when people go through the valley of weeping, they can find a place where there is a wellspring, where there is refreshing, where there is new strength to go on in the purposes of God. And so then this portion ends up those who are on the highway to Zion, to heaven. They go through the valley of weeping, but there they'll be refreshed by wellsprings, and they go from strength to strength until each appears before God in Zion. Zion, speaking of our heavenly final destination, but we'll go through valleys. And many times the fastest way to the mountaintops is that we take roads through the valleys. If you've 
taken many hikes or done long distance driving, you know, most of the time, the roads aren't on the top of the mountains. The roads are going up through the valleys. And so we aren't to fear the valleys. We are to go through them, pressing on in God, receive what we need from these difficult experiences to change our hearts. The sorrow of a valley of weeping, we will become like Jesus, the man of sorrows, who himself descended into this valley of a sin-stained world to relate to us, to reach to us, to bring us the water of life. And as we go through these experiences, we will find that for our lives, and you can become a wellspring of life and salvation for many others also. And so we are pilgrims. We travel through valleys much more often than mountains. But it says of this valley, as we travel through it, as we're headed upward, we go from strength to strength. We're going up to the mountaintop of Zion, and it's through the valley. You don't climb up a cliff. No, you go through the valleys. They are low places, but valleys can safely lead us higher and higher. Weeping will endure for a night, but joy will come in the morning. For the Christian pilgrim, we need to go through valleys and let them lead us higher up into the purposes of God. There is a purpose for each valley we pass through in life and a way out through each valley. So have you felt spiritually dry, disconnected, or dead? In the Valley of Dry Bones, you can reconnect with God, reconnect with those that God wants you to be close to in the body of Christ, reconnect with your family, even reconnect with your own heart and don't have a divided heart. And as we come to this fresh unity, the wind of God can begin to blow and give us new power. If You've been in a valley of weeping. Let that motivate you to go on in God and say, uh, I don't like this. I'm not going to stay here. By God's grace, I will pass through the valley and find the wells and the springs and the rivers. And I will gain new strength to go upward towards Mount Zion and our final destination. So let's learn God's purposes for these valleys these and many other valleys in the scriptures so that we can come to our final destination, the mountaintop of heaven, and find that we have traveled through life safely, securely, and with great fruitfulness and future reward. So don't give up when you're facing battles. When you're in the valleys, we'll go through them. It's often the fastest way for us to go on in God. But let us learn to persevere because our God not only can give us joy, strength, uh, refreshings, and, and revival, and, and, and do great things, not only on the mountaintops. He is not only the God of the mountains. Our God is the God of the valleys. And if that's where you find yourself Today or next month or next year, please just remember this message. We are headed for the mountaintop of mountaintops, heaven itself. But in the meantime, we want to learn how to find God's victories through the difficult experiences of life because our God is the God of the valleys. Hallelujah. Thank you and God bless you.